Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to SFC's Food for Thought series. For those of you who are just seeing SFC for the first time, we are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals who believe that Canada can have a strong future in energy and the environment. Please connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Students for Canada if you want to learn more about what we do. Today, we are hosting Andy Ma, former CEO of Advantage Energy and Entropy Incorporated. He recently retired and is still on the board and very engaged in Canadian resource advocacy. We are thrilled to speak with Andy about carbon sequestration and carbon capture innovation from oil and gas companies. Before I hand the floor over to Andy, please know that attendees are welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box, um, and we will address those questions at the end of the session. I will now share the spotlight with our guest. Welcome, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Perry, and uh, I'm more than uh, happy to be uh, speaking with everyone today, and hopefully there's uh, several that were able to uh, plug into this discussion. Just some perspectives that I thought I'd throw up there, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of information out there, some misinformation, some not so clear, uh, all kinds of stuff around carbon emissions and what's going on with all that, but, you um, you know, the commitment that Canada has made here and several other countries here through COP26 uh, in the continued dialogue is uh, to try to get to net zero by 2050. And, you know, let, let's not uh, kid ourselves. This is a gargantuan effort. Um, you know, there's no easy button, as I uh, show on this slide. But, you know, there's a cost component. There's collaboration components that have to be uh, put together in the right way, and it's uh, it's going to be a big challenge. But just to give you an idea of uh, the kind of dollars we're talking about, you know, 130 to 150 trillion dollars uh, from today to net zero 2050 is some of the estimates that you know the um, IEA and others have put out. That's five trillion a year, and how much you know? I mean, we all kind of sit back and say, what is a trillion dollars? I mean, it's a lot of money, but to put some perspective, and those of you that you know may know uh, the Apollo space program that the U.S. Uh, conducted over many, many years and many flights, that was 250 billion in 2020 dollars. So to put it kind of apples to apples as close as we can, you can see the the uh, magnitude of what it's going to require here. Um, you know, and what we've studied is that in order to make a big dent on this or to make a material impact, it's really carbon capture sequestration that's uh, gonna be a key to impacting many of the industries and especially the power energy industries to make those uh, significant reductions here. There's a lot of small and new technologies that we see in uh, you know, R&D efforts by many startup companies and new initiatives that have been kicked out. You know, We know most of that R&D work in general, a lot of it, uh, which is good that it's happening, but in reality, a lot of it uh, unlikely succeeds or can scale. So, but everything helps, as we know, you know, we've got everything from, you know, trying to uh, create some new net zero soap to all kinds of things. Those things all help, but at the end of the day, to make a big impact, it's going to take, uh, you know, a, quite an effort. And collaboration on all fronts. I mean, that, you know, we saw that through COP26, even with the uh, global leaders talking uh, it's challenging. You know, uh, some of the big nations who are the bigger emitters weren't even there, right? And um, even within Canada, we've got uh, both sides of uh, conversations here that are not necessarily aligned. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of discussion that's going to have to happen to make this work. One of my views is that, you know, there's been too much chatter about different energy sources and which one is better than the other and we should get rid of some of them but I, I don't think in my view that's the right path to be following I think what we should be doing is as I indicate that you know the focus has to be on the cleanest most affordable and reliable energy supply mix and that could be different for every country or even some regions but in order to company that because of different weather conditions, different terrain and, and things that uh, we have to deal with. Like in Canada, we know go from minus 40 to, you know, plus 40 sometimes in some areas. So how do we make that work? It's so the energy mix, I think, is really important to get that and think about what's right there. And uh, then from there, I think we got a building block to say, how do we, you know, make sure every one of those uh, energy supplies is the cleanest. A lot of the companies and, uh, and sectors in the energy world uh, in Canada have the 
expertise. We have a lot of great technology, a lot of great people that have done a lot of this. And when you think about uh, some, and we'll talk about that. When we think about some of the processes needed to get there, a lot of it is the acumens around engineering, business, markets, and, and so on, finance that have to be there. So the existing companies who have that and are proven, uh, are proven, come on, uh, 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 that have proven themselves to be able to conduct the business and be profitable are the ones that are likely going to take the lead. And, you know, Vantage itself, we talked about this uh, many years ago. You know, our mission, we've always said, deliver the cleanest energy we can. And we've uh, ourselves put ourselves uh, at a target of net zero by 2025 and utilizing our uh, CCS technology. We are the one of the first, and I think are the first in Canada to uh, uh, indicate that we can uh, have a commercial project at these kind of carbon prices and credits out there. So that is a first breakthrough, let's call it that in terms of the economics and uh, we can, see ourselves to transfer that to many other industries. So just a few slides here. Um, you know, there's lots of numbers, as I said, to make it uh, kind of in perspective here, you know, the, the human population over the years have, we do contribute uh, more CO2 than the earth can naturally sequester itself or clean up. And it's about 18 gigatons in excess. So Let's put some of that in perspective. I talked, you know, we talked about million tons, megatons, people talk about, but just to give you an idea, like one person on an airplane on a round trip from New York to Paris, that's one ton of CO2 emissions. You know, a typical passenger vehicle that's a combustion engine, 4.6 tons a year. Uh, the UFC, the, the campus itself, uh, what I found was uh, some data there in 2018, it was 230,000 tons a year with all the emissions that are necessary for power and everything that uh, the UC uh, best estimates, I guess they provided was 230,000 tons. So when you start thinking about that, these are massive numbers. You know, we have to get an idea that uh, just like it says in the bottom there, like 18 gigatons of CO2 is more than 400 times the current global carbon sequestration. So what is globally capturing today and sequestering for uh, carbon and CO2 it's 400 times that. So we've got a big chore ahead of us if we want to get to that net zero target by 2050. Uh, large emitters in terms of countries, and I think some of you have uh, seen some of this, you know, come through in different uh, publications and so on. But, you know, the big guys are Canada or China, US, India, Russia. You know, you can see them at the top left of this uh, graph here. You know, Canada is somewhere around 2% or just under 2%. And it's been like that for uh, some time. So between 0.7 and 1 billion tons per annum. Uh, however, even though we are smaller in the global scale of emissions, you know, Canada has always been seen as one that can be a technology leader. And we've done that. We see that with many industries. Oil and gas is another great example where a lot of the technologies that were developed to extract um, oil and gas more efficiently and economically all over the world was developed in Canada. And it still is today. So something that, you know, we can be proud of that our uh, scientists and engineers, ge geoscientists and business leaders uh, all aspire to uh, being able to create that. Um, and again, uh, the bottom couple of other graphs there, the bottom graph just shows on a percentage basis how much each of these countries contribute. So the big one, the big guys there are the ones that, you know, we have to be able to uh, get to the table if we're going to make a difference. Uh, it's not to say that some of those countries that are smaller emitters can make uh, an impact too. We can, but hopefully the technology we develop, we can export and get them to do it. So when you look at the type and the uh, contributions, to the CO2 uh, emissions, like what, what makes it up, what industries, what sectors, you know, power energy is a big part of it. Um, so globally, you know, countries need and desire, you know, they need heat, they need cooling, they need energy to run your iPhones and computers and businesses. Uh, travel's a big one. Uh, manufacturing's another big one. And you can see there as it stacks up that, um, you know, power is a big component. And then the other uh, uh, sectors are also big. You can see a couple of big ones there. Cement is also sizable in the big scheme of things. So even cement itself, there are technologies uh, being pursued and some have been you know, starting to get some success to reduce the emissions in those industries. But most projections that I've seen and, you know, and I think some of you have read 
is that the power energy demand is not going to decline. I, I think that, uh, you know, as we see the thirst for more devices and computers and power and countries that have actually today, third world countries that are uh, call it energy poverty, they don't have what we have. Uh, they just can't go and plug their uh, uh, something into the wall and have uh, reliable power or cost a lot or they just can't even get it. Those are not going to people, uh, human behavior is not going to change. You know, I think that that, that lifestyle the desirability of that is going to continue. And that's why, um, you know, we're going to have to figure this out, right? From the point of view of not saying that we can reduce all the usage here, but figure out ways to uh, make it all cleaner. And that's why my point was, we need to focus on the cleanest energy sources here. The uh, Canadian upstream oil and gas sector, just to give you some uh, idea, the you know the uh, emission intensity metrics are pretty good. Like we, most of the companies in Canada that operate here, uh, oil and gas extraction and production, you know, are some of the lowest in the world, and uh, we forget that. We hear a lot about that the oil and gas uh, sector, and it does overall have uh, you know contribute maybe twenty to thirty percent of the emissions in this country, but we hear about it. I think in a way that comes across as being, well, we're the, you know, this sector is, if we can get rid of all, all these guys, we'd be all good. Well, that's not necessarily so. Um, so, you know, when you look at this list of companies and what what's on there is the trading uh, symbols, the public trading symbols that trade on the stock exchanges. Uh, a couple of companies at the front in there, like Arc uh, Resources, Birchcliff, Advantage, Tourmaline, a few names you might've heard of. But some of the most of them on the front end are gas weighted companies, and they are the lowest uh, that we have in the sector here. And this, these emissions are quite low when you think about it. You know, the note on there is tourmaline, it's equivalent to having like two beers. Um, that's what they their intensity is on a per uh, barrel of oil equivalent production basis. So, advantages is equivalent to like four lattes. So on a, on a, for every barrel of energy we produce, that's the kind of emissions. So we are very low. And I think we should be proud that, uh, you know, Canada is already way ahead of a lot of other countries in the uh, oil and gas sector here. And uh, it provides a lot of the things that we enjoy without thinking about it. Lifestyle, food, manufacturing, health. These all come from the products that uh, we develop. So I'm going to get into entropy now, advantage and entropy. And some of these, you know, there's a lot more information on our uh, website here on the Vantage website, which also has a link to the Entropy Inc. website. If you uh, search those, you'll find a lot more. But I'm not going to get into all the little nitty gritty technical details. But um, to give you an idea, this was a collaboration of uh, basically three firms that created uh, the Entropy Sidecar Clean Tech Company. So Vantage has been around for you know, 20 years. In fact, uh, we celebrated our 20 year anniversary last year. It's uh, primarily a natural gas producing company, a mid-sized uh, Canadian company. But what I highlighted here was we've had well over 10 years of expertise already in capturing, sequestering, and also monetizing those carbon credits from our uh, carbon dioxide that we extract at our gas plant. And um, lots of in-house earth science professionals and technical professionals that you know, have worked in that to, to uh, hone up that skill set. And uh, we thought we could leverage that further. So what does it do? What, what, is, um, what does all this, you know, entropy, its technology do? So, you know, here's a slide here. And uh, there's a lot of uh, tag words that we use to like reverse, you know, reverse engineering, carbon capture technology, and so on. Um, the reason for that reverse concept is the fact that, you know, we, we come from the, you know, when you think about it, we're not, we're using what we know in the back end of what we already have done and the ideas to kind of back design uh, how to do this to extract different types of CO2 sources. So starting on the left-hand side at that, uh, this picture here, the diagram shows, um, you know, a little picture of our Vantage gas plant. So in the gas plant, what we've been doing for the last dozen years or so is that, you know, the gas that comes out of the ground, uh, the, the Montney Reservoir that we produce from, has some CO2 in it. It's not, uh, it's pretty natural that, it, that most uh, gases from, you know, and oil, associated oil, let's say from the ground 
uh, does have components of CO2. And we, what we had to do was extract that anyway to make, uh, to take that out so that we could provide clean burning methane. So we already were doing it. And then we, uh, we would separate that in the uh, stream of gas coming from the ground and sequester it back into the ground about three kilometers below the surface. So what the other parts of the plant though, also create additional exhaust and that's uh, the exhaust comes from things like engines, compressors, you know, boilers and so on where there's a heat source and we're burning, um, let's say natural gas, which we do at our, at our facility. We burn natural gas and the CO2 from that, you know, either you can capture it or it, it uh, is vented into the atmosphere. And what we said was, let's take this, our technology and try to find a way to capture the, that exhaust stream and sequester that back into the ground. So, you know, there, lo and behold, was the design that we worked with with ABC and uh, the university. And we came up with some proprietary uh, designs and solvent, which, which was key to extract what came out of our compressors and engines. And the difficulty in that is that it has not, you know, it has been done in the past. Uh, this exhaust gas is three to 5% CO2 content. The gas that we uh, were extracting from the ground was 1%. So when you start moving that CO2 concentration up, and in some cases, in some different uh, industries, you could be up to five to 10, 15%. That gets tougher to do. And the higher CO2, you, you know, to do it efficiently and economically was the question. So there was, there's been attempts, there's some projects that uh, have tried, but it costs a lot and it just isn't very efficient. So this, when you move into the middle of the, the, those little pictures there, it's, you know, the process really is the, you know, the carbon dioxide, which comes in the exhaust stream. And it has other components, as we know, kind of uh, NOx gases and so on. We bubble that through a solvent and the solvent is a custom designed solvent that is an amine base. And what happens is that that is a, it reacts and absorbs and it, it, it captures, it pulls the CO2 out of that uh, mixed gas stream. And what we do is we can segregate that CO2 then and then deal with it. And then the solvent in fact is regenerated and we reuse it. So it's, it's quite efficient. And how good that solvent uh, behaves in terms of uh, how much heat do you need to regenerate it and how long it lasts, those are key components of efficiency and economics of making this process cheaper than, uh, than it has been historically. So if we can make it cheaper, more efficient and easily to modify into different industries, that is going to be able to uh, uh, then extend our technology and have other industries do more carbon capture, right? So when we ca capture that CO2, when you move to the right, what we do is uh, that CO2 stream then is compressed through, uh, through the engines and compressors again. And then we push it down about three kilometers below surface into the reservoir. And uh, we put it into a reservoir that's isolated so that there's no leakage. And uh, the CO2 is then, when you think about it, the whole process then captures carbon, sequesters it into the ground. And the other component that you've heard about is you know, the utilization or CCUS. So if we were able to take this CO2 and utilize it to create other things, which there could be a possibility here. Um, you know, you could, you, some people are experimenting that into cements or using CO2 actually to make diamonds. So as I mentioned that, you know, we had a track record of doing this anyway at one of our properties, our main property out in uh, the glacier area, which is just around Grand Prairie. Um, you know, as many, the picture there shows uh, a typical uh, Montney gas development where there's a lot of horizontal wells we capture the gas, do all that, and then sell the uh, natural gas and some of the byproducts. Um, but over the years, we've uh, collected over $10 million in carbon credits. So what happens is that the CO2 that we can capture and sequester, what, what because it is, uh, if you normally would not be able to capture that and sequester it, you'd have to pay a carbon tax. But in Alberta, the scheme was set up years ago where it became a credit. So if you were doing that, you would actually would get a credit and you could take those credits and offset your own emissions. Or if you had excess, you actually could sell those into other big companies. You know, and there's big companies like the shells of the world or power companies that would buy your carbon credits. And we've been able to uh, 
capitalized on that over the many years. So we're doing this, it's modular also. Um, this just shows here, you know, one of the compressor buildings uh, inside the gray. So there's a compressor and an engine in there running. And this is the, what you see in the uh, kind of red and white and the, and the tower there in the uh, yellow gold color is the piece of equipment that would be uh, uh, modularly added to each one of these compressors. And uh, what they do is then capture the exhaust gas. And that's how the, each, of these, uh, each of these units would take the CO2 and, and then we would collect it all together and take it back and re-inject it in the ground. And that's, that's why we call modular because you can expand this into several um, a, a number of different uh, engines and compressors as well as boilers and pumps and so on that use, you know, wherever there's a engine that drives that, right? That's where you can capture it. And that's why it's pretty good that you can extend it into other industries. And this just shows, uh, you know, the, the market opportunity across uh, all kinds of different uh, sectors here. If you look at um, the left graph, and it takes a second to kind of see what we're talking about here, but what it is, is it shows the number of facilities uh, in Canada that, um, that report their emission levels. And you can see that there is a lot of them that are very small, you know, 10,000 tons per year or up to 100,000. And there's some of the bigger ones, but there's, uh, you know, 60 that are kind of over a million tons per year. Right, so there's a lot of smaller industries uh, or smaller units in these uh, plants and industries and that emit a lot, but at a small, a smaller amount. And that's what the market opportunity is for entropy is to be able to take that technology, go and, and talk to these different sectors, whether it's cement or food manufacturing or agriculture, you know, again, wherever they're utilizing engines and boilers and so on, we can uh, help them reduce their emissions, right? And that's that's what I like the most about, um, you know, part of what we've developed is the fact that this isn't just an oil and gas solution. This is something to be quite proud of that in Western Canada, yeah, you know, Vantage took the step here to create this and we can take that and extend it to other energy, energy uh, sectors where they're utilizing or manufacturing. And it can be, uh, obviously there's similar uh, industries in, uh, manufacturing uh, power uh, units all over the world, right? And we've been contacted by some of those that have asked us, can our technology work in different spots around the world for what they do? So we're quite busy uh, analyzing and working through that at this time. And, you know, so the question is, one of the questions that comes up is, well, that sounds great. So you have this at Glacier or gas plant where we can inject the CO2 into the ground, but can you do it all over? Like how many places can you actually go and inject um, the CO2 that you extract? And, you know, when we looked at this and there's, you know, a lot of geological information here that uh, has been accumulated over the years from not just us, but other geological uh, studies that show you that there is a lot of storage potential in North America. And you can see deep saline storage. So, you know, where there is uh, reservoirs underground that contain salt water or, you know, we can inject into, they're highlighted in the blue areas. And a lot of those aren't that far away from major manufacturing areas. Um, so the ability to develop this technology and then utilize it in those uh, areas where there's lots of manufacturing, lots of industry. Uh, in fact, you can, as you, as you may have heard also, you can collect the CO2 and transport it in a pipeline for some distance. So we can collect, there's a lot of opportunity in North America. And when we looked at uh, some of Europe, there's some uh, fantastic places, Europe and Asia to do this too. So um, that, that then, you know, addresses some of the questions that people had as well. Maybe you can only do it in three places in North America. Well, no, it's, it's quite widespread. So why is all this important? Just, you know, something that I thought I'd just throw a few points up to say, you know, you sit back, um, Again, it's going to require this whole initiative, uh, you know, of generating and developing good, the best, clean, affordable energy is going to require a lot of fantastic uh, people that come out of universities and other uh, secondary institution, uh, secondary education centers that can help do this. Scientists, engineers, you know, marketing people, 
a lot of creativity and leadership is uh, is what we need and uh, each individual can make a big difference here and again i think what i would ask is i think my dog's making noise if you can hear him but the um you know your voices are important as any um to the public and the politicians that you know let's not get stuck in this entrenched discussion uh, which is i think futile, futile about one source over the other it's really trying to find out like i said what is the most affordable and reliable and cleanest energy mix that we should be looking to and then finding and employing the technology to get there right and energy suppliers like i said already are way ahead of the game we can commercialize we've done it and uh make enough scale and impact to make a difference and um, canada is a leading clean country so don't forget that that you know, we are already, you know, one of the cleanest uh, country, uh, emission and lowest emitting countries in the world, but we do have a lot of expertise and technology here. And the other component of all this is that, you know, if we continue and we do have um, a very good clean energy mix today, but if we can even export those to countries that are use, uh, utilizing still lots of coal and other, you know, products that, um, that are much dirtier in terms of emissions or higher emissions, we can help reduce the energy poverty amongst those third world nations, make a global impact and uh, do what Canada should be doing is, you know, exporting all of our uh, expertise and technology to help others, right? And I think we're all, you know, on the same uh, wavelength on that one.